Okay, uh, so welcome back everyone. Welcome to the new faces, or new names at least. Um, so as you know, we were supposed to have a talk, um, a chat with Imogen tonight about research on snow leopards, but Hurricane Laura had has made it difficult for her for her to be with us tonight. Uh, fortunately, we still get to hear about wildcats since um, Ariana is here to talk to us about her research on bobcats, which is um, which is great. Um, due to last minute planning, um, just to say that her committee didn't really allow her to share all of her results, so she's just she's just going to do her best to share what we, what she can. Um, I just remind you that if you have questions, just put them in the chat while she's talking, and we're just going to. Uh, chat later um, about all this. So thank you, Ariana, for accepting to do this very last minute. And uh, you can share your screen now. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, but it's not letting me. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Do, be, maybe because you left and you're not co-host anymore. Let me check. Yeah, I'm sorry. Now you should be able to. All right, do you see it? Yeah, all good. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Ariana Serretta. I am a master's student at the University of Delaware. And I am studying bobcats in New Jersey, um, specifically related to landscape connectivity. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about um, wildcats and urbanization and how that relates to bobcats and New Jersey. So as you may know, urbanization creates challenges for wildcats, no matter where you are in the world. Um, when you have urbanization, one of the first challenges that it creates is habitat fragmentation and destruction. So when natural habitat is cleared for construction of urban cover types, um, you end up destroying the natural habitat and fragmenting what is already existing. And you end up with patches of habitat that are suitable for whatever species um, is in the area. Additionally, um, when you have urbanization, it also creates barriers to dispersal. So animals need to be able to travel from habitat patch to habitat patch to find mates, to find resources, uh, to live in their habitat. And so when you have urbanization, a lot of times comes with that roads and railways and just parking lots and stuff that animals and wildcats don't necessarily want to cross. And so this ends up becoming a barrier. And one of the last things that comes with um, urbanization is um, anthropogenic causes of mortality. And so when you have increased urbanization, you end up introducing animals to other threats of death that they wouldn't normally have it just existing in the wild. So for example, um, people oftentimes don't like to have rats near their home, and so they'll put out rodenticide. And if the rat eats rodenticide, it, the, it's possible that a bobcat or another wild cat could eat this um, rat that died of rodenticide and then be poisoned itself. Another major issue is when bobcats, like this individual here, is trying to cross a road, um, they can encounter vehicles and be killed via collisions. And so this isn't unique to bobcats or North American species. This can be found um, all around the world where animals are threatened by this. Um, this is an example of a paper on the Asiatic leopard where they found that habitat further from human settlements was better for the leopards and that when the leopards were in areas of higher human disturbance, they actually were less active during the day than in regions where there was less human disturbance. A little bit closer to my home in North America, there um, was a study done on pumas and jaguars that showed that um, pumas or mountain lions or cougars, they're all the same species, we just have three different words for it in English, um, Pumas were more tolerant of human disturbance than the jaguar seen here. 
And in terms of jaguars on their own, a recent study found that female jaguars avoided roads and were less tolerant of roads than male jaguars. And so when you're considering wildcats and urbanization, you have to consider not only the species itself, but the demographic of the species and how they interact with urbanization, whether it be sex or age class. Um, in North America and in South America, where the puma exists, the effects of um, urbanization has shown to impact this big cat. Um, they found that in areas where urbanization is um, higher, the cougar will eat more urban type diet. So it's kind of what you'd expect. A cougar's in a more urbanized area, it's gonna eat urban species. And they've also found that um, cougar populations had a lower population density in ex-urban areas um, and that their population density was roughly the same for wildlife urban interface and the wildland. Um, important to note where there were areas of high human disturbance, uh, cougars were less likely to be detected. And now to my study species, bobcats and urbanization. There are a lot of studies on this species because it is so wide ranging in the United States and the United States is full of urbanization. Um, a lot of studies have come out investigating how it impacts this um, medium sized wildcat. Um, and so these first set of papers here essentially show that urbanization roads and human development affect the home ranges of the species. Um, more urbanization causes home ranges to increase in size because the bobcat's going to have to expand its area to find all the resources it needs to survive. They have also found that um, urbanization can affect females disproportionately as they incorporate less urban land cover into their home ranges. And so when there's a lot, a large percentage of urban land cover in an area, it's hard for the females to establish um, home ranges. Um, additionally, um, roads have an effect on bobcats as well and can affect the genetic flow within bobcat populations and also serve as um, boundaries for home ranges. And so these are a lot of papers up here. This is just a summary of kind of the general idea of how uh, urbanization affects bobcats and brings us to why I am studying bobcats in New Jersey. And so here's a brief history of bobcats in New Jersey. Um, bobcats are a medium small um, felid native to North America. You can see that its range extends into Mexico and up into southern Canada. Um, there's gaps in its range in the U.S. here in what we call the breadbasket in the Midwest where there was a lot of agriculture and bobcats were historically extirpated. And right here along the eastern coast of the U.S. where they were also extirpated for various reasons including urbanization, agriculture, and bounties. Um, it is the most broadly distributed feedlid native to North America and it's in 47 of the 48 contiguous um, United States. The only state that it is not found in is Delaware, just south of New Jersey. And so you can see right here, this is where we're going to zoom in on. This is where New Jersey is located in the US. And this map here is of New Jersey. And in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, there were bounties placed on bobcats, which means uh, people were paid to kill bobcats and turn them in. Um, at, by 1757, bobcats were reported as rare throughout the whole state. In the 19th and 20th centuries, populations of bobcats were declining in New Jersey, probably due to increased urbanization and agricultural conversion of the landscape. And in the 1960s, the only verifiable reports of uh, bobcats were found in northern New Jersey, um, where this circle is. Um, from 1978 to 1982, the state of New Jersey decided that they wanted to translocate some bobcats to bolster the population existing in the north. 
So they ended up translocating 24 bobcats from northern New Jersey or from Maine into northern New Jersey. In 1991, the bobcat was classified as endangered in New Jersey. And so a little bit about endangered species in the US, you have federally listed endangered species and then you have state listed species. And so the bobcat is not a federally listed endangered species. Their populations are doing great overall in the US, but state by state, um, if a population is declining, the state has the prerogative to list it as endangered or threatened. So in New Jersey, we list it as endangered, which gave the bobcat more protections underneath law. In 2016, um, New Jersey um, conducted a population estimate of the northern population. It was estimated to be around 270 individuals, and there was still no real evidence for central and southern populations of bobcats. And most recently, in March 2017, a bobcat was caught on camera trap, and you can also see some tracks here tracks uh, here um, in a central location in New Jersey, which is the farthest south that a bobcat had been identified to date. And so why are there still no bobcats in southern New Jersey? Is there no good habitat? Are there barriers keeping the northern population from going south? This is the central question to my research in New Jersey. And so we hypothesized that one of the biggest issues was that there were barriers and the bobcats physically were not able to get to southern New Jersey. We thought that there was probably habitat in southern New Jersey that would be suitable for bobcats, but that they couldn't get past um, a corridor of urbanization that runs through central New Jersey, which I'll show you on a following slide. And so this picture is actually I-95, which is a big transportation corridor that runs from Philadelphia to New York. And we thought that it's probably pretty difficult to, for a bobcat to get past all the urbanization associated with this road and transportation network. Um, the next picture I, is a picture of a dead bobcat. So if you don't want to see it, um, now is your chance to close your eyes. I will tell you when the picture is gone. Uh, we also think that roads are a big barrier for um, bobcats as well because there were 77 road mortalities documented in northern New Jersey for from 2005 to 2017 and there's an average of 6.4 mortalities per year in northern New Jersey. So we think that road mortalities is also probably contributing to um, why bobcats can't get across. They're dying every time they try and disperse south. And the picture's gone for anybody who closed their eyes because they didn't want to see a dead bobcat. Um, a little bit about urbanization in New Jersey. You can divide New Jersey into roughly three sections and we have for our study um, so that it's easy to talk about. Um, this is northern New Jersey. And in northern New Jersey, there is um, about 26% urban cover mostly located on the southeast aspect of this northern section. You have central New Jersey, which runs approximately from Philadelphia to New York, connecting it. And central, the central region is 51% urban land cover. And then you have southern New Jersey, which includes the Pine Barrens and it is 20% urban cover approximately. And so you can see that this northern and southern region are separated by this diagonal swath of largely urbanized landscapes running from southwest to northeast across the state. And it's connecting largely this Philadelphia to New York. And then there's also the greater Trenton area here in the middle, which provides a lot of um, urbanization. We know that there's habitat in the north since there is a nice population of bobcats there located mainly in the deciduous forest cover type that is here. In the south, we assume that there's bobcat habitat as 
all this forest down here is uh, primarily pine barrens and mixed forest. And so um, the objectives of the first chapter of my study um, were to create a habitat suitability index for bobcats throughout New Jersey. And so for people who aren't aware of what a habitat suitability index is, it's a pre predictive index that indicates um, where good habitat exists for bobcats that meets their needs. It gives them suitable prey, gives them suitable cover, gives them um, places to de den, gives them enough area to move around and rest. And we essentially give it an arbitrary score on a sliding scale about if it's good or bad. And so our objective for this was to see, is their habitat throughout New Jersey? Is this Southern assumed habitat um, actually good habitat for bobcats based off of um, relationships in the literature and the construction of our index? Our second objective was to identify pinch points and barriers to dispersal throughout New Jersey and get a picture of how connectivity in New Jersey is functioning. And so for these pinch points, these pinch points are essentially bottlenecks where bobcats would have to move through if they were to disperse from the north to the south. And a little bit about our methods for our suitability index. Um, since um, we only have a northern bobcat population, we decided instead of building a habitat suitability index based on bob known bobcat locations, we decided to base it off of habitat relationships from the literature since southern New Jersey has such a different ecotype than northern New Jersey. Because the bobcats of northern New Jersey aren't necessarily indicative of the only habitat that bobcats can exist in. Bobcats are a generalist species. They can exist anywhere from shrublands in very arid Texas to pinelands in Georgia. And so we felt like it was um, better suited for our study to look at these habitat relationships from the literature to make these predictions since the bobcats in northern New Jersey wouldn't necessarily be predictive of whether the pine barrens and the pine and mixed forest in southern New Jersey would be suitable habitat. And so we ended up using different data sets from publicly sourced um, information. So we used land cover, we used the most recent um, release land cover data for the US, which is 2016. We used an elevation layer hydrology and roads in a rasterized landscape. For anybody who doesn't work with maps and map data, a rasterized landscape is essentially a grid with a bunch of cells and each cell has a value that indicates a characteristic about where that cell is in the world. And we considered variables at both local and landscape scale. You can see the variables we considered over here. And what is interesting about our study is that we used a different weighting scheme that then is normally done. So these are hypothesized relationships based off of what we read in the literature um, to, uh, for the different landscape variables. And so once we had scaled a variable value to zero to one, we ended up giving it a weighted score based off of these different gamma distributions. And then they were all summed together to give a value and the higher values indicated a higher um, a higher habitat suitability. The second part of our study to answer objective two and connectivity analyses is that we were using circuit theory and least cost paths to um, examine connectivity throughout different habitat patches. And so a little bit about circuit theory for people who haven't heard of it before. It borrows from uh, the science of electrical resistance. So we are borrowing from physics and from engineering and essentially applying it to a landscape. And so within a graph, which is what you see here, you have nodes connected by edges. And when you apply a voltage from one node to another, current flows through that edge. And when you apply resistances to it, as you can see in D, E, and F, it changes 
what current is running through it. And so when you run voltage from A to B here, it has many paths to go. And that's what's unique about circuit theory is it shows based off of the different resistance values in each of these edges, where the flow is most likely to go and whether there's redundancy in the landscape. So other paths that a bobcat or another animal could end up going. And this is a little different from least cost paths, which would just identify the single path which was most suitable. So let's say the least amount of resistance was from A to B going on this top route. Least cost paths would only show this top route. But circuit theory allows us to see all three routes, but also gives us but that there is redundancy in the landscape. So if a road is built here, a bobcat will still have opportunity to go in the southern route or in the middle route. And so this is an example of, um, from the literature of how circuit theory works is illustrating what I was just talking about. And so you have a resistance landscape, you have a habitat patch in the north and a habitat patch in the south. And least cost paths identifies the path of least resistance that a bobcat would need to use or any other species to get from A to B. When you apply circuit theory, it shows all the paths that you need to see. And so it can help you identify pinch points in the landscape and redundant paths. You could see that it is possible that an animal could go this weird convoluted southern route to get down to here. And so we have um, applied this type of analysis to get a better picture of connectivity in New Jersey. And so after my results are finalized, what can be done? And so when we submit this research to the state of New Jersey, they can make different conservation decisions. And these decisions are not necessarily specific to New Jersey and bobcats, but can be applied for many other species and can be applied in different states and countries. And they actually have been successfully um, implemented in different locations. And so there are different mitigation methods that can um, be done to help increase connectivity in a landscape in areas that have been identified that are either pinch points or important for con conserving to maintain connectivity. And so first you can reduce wildlife vehicle collisions. And so part of that is uh, working with humans so that humans are able to, with the signage, know that a lot of animals are moving through the area and to be more vigilant while they're driving vehicles. Another thing that could be implemented is our reflectors and auditory deterrence, depending on what species you're trying to keep from crossing the road. And this will, um, it deters them. It keeps them from wanting to cross the road because they either don't like how the reflection works or they don't like the sounds that they're hearing. And this is an example of some signage that is common in the US to indicate deer crossing roads. And another thing that can be implemented to mitigate um, issues with connectivity in a landscape is that you can implement crossing structures. So you can have overpasses, which end up going over a road and typically we'll have some sort of natural substrate that makes it easier for an animal to move. Or you can go under and have um, culverts, which will allow an animal to pass underneath the road and not having to go over it. And oftentimes all of these uh, mitigation methods can be combined with fences. So you can build a fence along the road and funnel the animal through the crossing structures that you want them to cross so that they aren't going over the road itself and risking being killed by cars. And the good news is, is that there is evidence that they are using these crossing structures. And so we know that um, cougars actually will use the crossing structures in the Trans-Canada Highway. Um, there, and here's a picture of a cougar using an underpass. Um, we know that they end up using them more frequently in the winter. And um, that we also know that structures that are nearby high cougar habitat suitability are more frequently used. And so that's important for the bobcat research and 
for consideration with the results that we end up finding because where we have good bobcat habitat, which was my first objective, and where connectivity needs to be increased, we know that bobcats are more are probably going to be similar to cougars and that they're probably going to use the crossing structures that are nearby good habitat, which logically makes sense. <laughs> and so a lot of people are, aren't necessarily involved in wildlife ecology, haven't heard of wildlife ecology research, um, but are interested in getting involved in helping. And so I also wanted to include some ways that citizens and people outside of the wildlife ecology field can actually help and contribute to um, helping urban wildlife and wildlife in general. So you can go to zooniverse.org and they have a whole bunch of camera trapping projects that different labs have put up there. And they, um, they have a little tutorial and they ask you to help ID animals in photos. So one of the most um, well-known ones is Snapshot Serengeti. And if you're interested in um, looking at some North American wildlife, there's Snapshot Wisconsin. Those two are active currently. Um, the different projects um, go in and out of activity depending on how many photos are available to look at. After photos are um, ID'd and analyzed, then the researchers can go in and actually do all their analyses on it. And so it's a great way to help out um, projects uh, with wildlife ecology and also get to see some pictures of some cool animals caught on candid camera. Another thing that you can do no matter where you are in the world is ebird.org and so you can go outside and just like write down a list of birds that you see during the day and submit your information on ebird. You can do it in urban areas. Um, I took this picture of a Canada goose just chilling out next to a road. And so you can go bird watching in urban areas, or you can even go in natural areas. If you're going on a hike, you can keep a list and you can submit it on eBird.org and ornithologists use that data to um, analyze bird movement, migration, and populations. And finally, if you're located in the US, um, you can go to citizenscience.org and they have, it is very location dependent. It depends on what projects they have going on but there are some opportunities to actually get outside and do some field work. They might need help maintaining cameras or doing some other um, research. And an example of a project that they have currently up on the website is urban edge habitat use by um, this flying squirrel species in California. And so go on there, see what projects need help. I know I saw another project on there that was with horseshoe crabs. And so on the east coast of the US, you would walk on beaches and count horseshoe crabs. And it's a good way you can help contribute data and get outside and help with wildlife ecology research and help uh, biologists like me do the work that we are doing. Um, I want to thank my committee for letting me do this talk last minute um, and my funding resources that um, fund my research. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Arianna. It was like, really fun. Uh, Thank you for sharing the methods at least because like, I had not heard of circuit theory and it was like really nice to see how it works. Uh, it was funny that you, when you talk about those bridges because I was about to say that it's exactly what we have here in Kenya because we have like huge highways that cross national parks and we have like so they are all fenced completely and you have bridges on top and it's um, nice to see that it's actually working and used elsewhere. Um, okay so I have a few questions. I'll start. If you guys have questions, just put them in the chat. Um, so the first one would be, um, so you said that uh, when they end up being in very urbanized areas, they will switch to urban prey. Like, would that be rats or things like that? Or like, would they maybe go after pets or as it changed? It is pop. Um, so that was the study on cougars. And when they say that they go after more urban prolific prey, um, a lot of times you won't have like the, the elk and other big deer species in town. And so they are shifting to eating like um, raccoons or rabbits or um, more common deer species in town rather than like elk or um, other species. Um, I guess it could incorporate pets. I um, don't remember. It's been a little bit since I've it's read okay. that study. 
<laughs> um, but um, I have lost my Zoom. Um, and and so it, it could be, it's possible that that does, that does create human wildlife conflict and fear of like big cats eating pets, but it actually doesn't happen all that common, especially if there is sufficient um, other prey in the area. So they haven't been- where there's pets or humans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they, they haven't been listed like as, as a kind of nuisance, like when they go around people's house, it's still going on fine? Are they just shy and go away, or are they some places where they can be considered a nuisance? It, from what I've read about at least pumas, it seems to be an individual cat issue. It's like some cats are a pest, and they have decided that eating people's chickens is really easy or eating their pets is really easy and so you'll have like an individual itself being a pest but as to characterize the whole population as doing that they found that it it kind of depends on individuals and with cougars they're really cool and that a lot of times they'll specialize in a certain type of prey it's like they'll figure out um how to capture something and then they'll just go for it over and over and over again because they've refined that skill so uh, there was a documentation of a female cougar. Um, can you guys still hear me? I think she's- Yes, losing. yes, <laughs> we can see. Okay. Um, there was a cougar on the West Coast that specialized in eating porcupines. And so she had figured out that you could flip the porcupine over so that the spines were down and it could attack the belly and eat them. And so um, at, in terms of like cougars eating um, undesirable prey and like domestic animals. I, I do think it's um, more based on the individual cat and probably uh, mitigating human wildlife conflict based around an, an individual. So like trapping that individual cougar and moving it to a national park or somewhere where it can't get to <laughs> the prey that it w has decided it wants to eat. Mm. And have there been any data on how now they are exposed to infectious diseases from pets, for example? So like last week we had a talk from Danny and she was talking about African wild dogs being exposed to rabies now um, a bit more because they used to go and hang out with domestic dogs. Has there, has there been anything like that for wild cats? Um, off the top of my head, I do not know. I know that it's possible that for wild cats that they can be exposed to distemper um, as well as rabies and um, I think FIV. Um, and so I guess there always is the possibility of transmission across, but it's, I'm speculating. This is not, not my specialty. I don't work with um, zoonotic diseases or, and transfer um, it, with wildcats in general. I work more about their movement across landscapes. No worries, no worries. Okay. Um, so thank you so much. It was really, really fun. I hope that we can talk again when you're able to share your results because I guess that if not everyone is very curious. Uh, so yeah, maybe next year or I don't know. We'll see. Uh, thank you so, so much. Yeah. It was very cool. Thank you again for doing this last minute. Very cool. Okay. So thanks. No problem. It was my pleasure. Joining. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I remind you that this talk is going to be on YouTube a bit later. Um, so if you follow us on Twitter, I usually announce when the talks are available. So just stay tuned for the talk and also for um, when Ariana may be coming back to tell us a bit more. Uh, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Well, it's evening for us. Have a good day wherever you are. And uh, thank you. See you again. Bye, Ariana.